God. Praise the Lord. Well, w- welcome to the 2015 International Fellowship Meeting in Des Moines, Iowa. We are, well, words are totally inadequate. I'm going to turn mine off uh, to express how honored we are to have these dear precious saints of the Most High God who've, who've invested their time and finances to be here for this fellowship meeting. and We pray that uh, it will be worthwhile that you will say after it's all done that, that it was worth it, that I'm so glad I was there. We're thankful for these ministers of the gospel from the body of Christ. We have represent, representatives of somewhere between 15 and 20 different nations sitting on this platform from North America, from South America, from Europe, from Asia, and from Africa. Uh, five different continents represented, and these ministers uh, are an authentic and organic part of the body of Jesus Christ, holding up the vision that God gave to Brother William Souders just a little over a hundred years ago, seeking restoration, seeking uh, to produce bride members, seeking to fulfill the mission of the church, and and we are so glad that you're here. Let me start with a few announcements. Um, When you came in, hopefully you got one of these brochures. If you didn't, you can get one from any of the ushers. Uh, It has a wealth of valuable information such as service times, uh, 11 o'clock and 7 p.m. tonight and tomorrow, 11 o'clock on Sunday, um, how to order DVDs and MP3s or CDs, I guess, of the, of the services, uh, our library, and our library also functions as a bookstore. We have some books for sale there. There's some others who have brought some material for sale including we have some Bibles, and we only sell quality Bibles. If you want a a cheap Bible, that's fine. You can get them at bookstores everywhere, but you can't find good quality Bibles anymore. Very, very difficult. Oxford quit printing them. There's a company in Scotland that I found through my brother Jonathan uh, that purchased the rights to republish Oxford long primer Bibles which is the one I use. I could never change because I don't know where the scripture is, but I know it's on this part of the page, and I can look for it there. Um, And people who get used to the Cambridge Bibles get to be the very same way. They know where it is, and they look for it. We also have Cambridge Bibles. Unfortunately, Cambridge has stopped uh, printing the Cambridge presentation, the nice size Bible, Uh, They won't print them anymore. I don't know why. I think it's because people generally, Christians generally, aren't willing to spend the money to get a nice Bible. But they'll sure spend it on a boat or an SUV or McDonald's hamburgers. We do have plenty of the smaller Concord. There's just a few of the Cambridge presentation, the larger Bibles left. We have a few in there because they're no longer printed, the the nicest ones, the goatskin ones. If you can find one on the internet, I've seen them priced as high as $800 because they're rare. You just can't find them. We sell them cheaper than that. Um, But there's other interesting material in there. You'll find that in this brochure. You'll find a little map with restaurants and and other pertinent information, the menu, we strive to feed you very well, very fine meals here. Um, at least I think so, except for the broccoli. I don't like broccoli. I pay for the broccoli every year. That way I can throw it away and I don't feel the least bit guilty. No, it's not that I don't like broccoli. I'm teasing um, a little bit. Information. Information. If you can stay with us for Monday, we always have a picnic on the grounds. 
you're still in town, you're welcome to come. We usually eat around 3 o'clock. If it's raining, we'll eat inside. If it's nice, like we pray it's going to be nice, then we'll have an outdoor picnic. Um, this building, there's a hall that runs completely around the sanctuary. If you go out, just keep wandering. Eventually, you'll find your way wherever you're going. Either that or you'll circle the building for hours. Um, we have four restrooms, two men's restrooms on this side of the building, one in the back hall, one off across from our meditation court, that greenhouse-looking thing. Uh, same way with women's restrooms, one on this side by the meditation court, one in the back hallway. Uh, we'll be receiving two offerings during this meeting. Tomorrow, we'll, during the day service, we'll receive an offering to help defray the costs of this meeting. And then tomorrow evening, we will... Re uh, receive a missionary offering because these ministers that have come from India and different nations in Africa, um, we do not pay their way here at all. They have to purchase their own round-trip ticket to get here. And then once they are here, we try to reimburse them one half of what they paid. They have to pay the other half. It becomes a real sacrifice if you're living in a country that has a very poor economy like Zimbabwe, it is a big sacrifice to come to this meeting. And we're honored that so many of these ministers are willing to make that sacrifice. Because it costs them something, they appreciate what they have. We don't send monthly checks. We have hundreds of churches overseas that look this way and we don't send financial support to one of them, not one. But they build their own buildings. They start out humble. But over time, God blesses them. And very poor people who have nothing are taught to tithe. And there's a principle of God that he blesses people who put him first. And it doesn't matter whether you start out wealthy or start out poor. You start out by giving to God. God blesses people for that. And I've been in some beautiful facilities in very poor countries because of the principles of the body of Christ that have been put in these uh, countries and in these people. They build their own facilities. They're beautiful. And uh, God has blessed them. But we do ask you to help us in the missionary offering Saturday night to help defray just part of the cost of having these ministers here. And then uh, inside the back cover of your brochure, if you got it, uh, there's a picture of a mountain and a little plastic bag stapled on there. And there's something in that little bitty plastic bag. I doubt that you can see it. Um, but when God's involved, something small can be transformed into something great. I've got a mustard seed in each one of these bags. And I bought these mustard seeds in Israel and brought them here to give to you. Don't say I've never given you anything. You can see it's pretty tiny. It, a single seed looks very insignificant. What does a mustard seed have to offer? You think it's very valuable? If it's very valuable, I probably wouldn't have given you each one. Does it look like something you can really rely upon? Um, how much faith does it take to move a mountain? That's a picture of Mount Hermon in Israel. How much faith does it take to move a mountain? Does it take a whole lot of faith? Does it take just a little bit of faith to move a mountain? Mustard's an annual plant. It's not a perennial like a tree or a shrub. It only grows one season and dies, just like marigolds and beans and virtually anything I try to plant. Um, but from just a tiny little seed, a plant, uh, next picture, the plant nearly 10 foot tall grows from this little seed. That's a phenomenal growth. Something very big grows very quickly from something that starts out very, very small. 
In the 17th chapter of the book of Matthew, a man came to Jesus and begged him to heal his son. I believe his son had epilepsy. I'm thankful that the Lord healed me of epilepsy. I suffered from that condition and the Lord healed me. But this father had tried to get help from Jesus' disciples and they had failed. But Jesus healed this boy. And later they asked him why they were unable to do the job. Jesus answered in, in Matthew 17 and verse 20. In the middle of the verse he said, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. The mustard seed was an expression in that time to signify something that's small or very little significance. And you wouldn't think much can come of that mustard seed. It's not something that just exudes expectation. You know, this is really going to be something. And people sometimes get the idea if I had big faith, I could do big things. But that isn't the case. All you need is just a little bit of faith in the Lord. Just a little faith in the Lord to see big things happen. In another occasion, Luke 17th chapter, Jesus was teaching his disciples there about unlimited forgiveness. And they said, Lord, increase our faith. And uh, he responded, I think in uh, verse 5 or 6, And said, if you had faith as of the grain of mustard seed, you might say to the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. And people think, I could do better things, I could do more things if I just had a little more faith. People feel like they just don't have enough faith to really trust God in difficult times. But, you know, I don't think... It takes a lot of faith. Does it take a mountain of faith to move a mountainous problem? Or does it just take a little bit? A little faith in the one who has the power to move mountains. It's not my faith that moves the mountains. It's God who moves the mountains. I just need faith in God. Just a little bit of faith in God. And he can take care of the problems. The focus isn't on us. It's not on the great faith we possess. Faith is not a magical potion. It's not faith in faith. It's faith in God. All we need is to have a little faith in God, and he can do what needs to be done. Jesus didn't say, if you had great, big, huge faith. He said, if you just had faith as the grain of mustard seed. The woman who had an issue of blood pressed her way through the crowd to touch the hem of his garment. She wasn't really thinking about anything other than her belief that Jesus had the power to heal her. She, was, she had a little bit of faith in him, and that was enough. Blind Bartimaeus kept crying out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He knew the one who was able to restore his vision. The centurion said to Jesus, all you have to do is speak a word and my servant will be healed. Um, Jesus asked two blind men once, I think it's the ninth chapter of Matthew, said, do you believe I'm able to do this? Do you believe? And they answered him and said, yes, Lord. See, faith is saying yes to God's ability. Do you mind if I say that again? Faith is saying yes to God's ability. It's not my ability. It's not what I can do. It's not what I possess. It's not uh, something that's really deep down within me. It's in God. Faith is saying yes to God's ability. People think if I, they, they get this idea because in life, you know, if you have more money, you can do more things. If you have more time, you can do more things. 
If you have more talent, you can do more things. If you have more opportunity, you can do more things. And then they get the idea, if I just had a little more faith, I could do bigger things for God, but I just don't have enough faith to stand up and testify. I just don't have enough faith to trust God in this problem. It's just not enough. And, and I keep, there's a reason I gave you this. Next time you question whether you have enough faith to trust God in a tough day, I'd like you to remember how big this is. I'd like you to think, I can at least have that much faith in God. And he can take care of the problems. It's not the size of the faith, it's the one the faith is directed to. In Hebrews, Paul said we have to believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. David didn't say, because I have great faith, I can do these things. But he said, by my God, I can run through a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. Uh, he one time said, through our God, we shall do valiantly. And the apostle John, in 1 John 5 he spoke about the faith that overcomes the world. It's not some big, powerful, massive, all-pervading faith. It's the simple, easily overlooked concept that God will do what he said he would do. It's not based on what we feel. My faith is based on who I know. not really asking us to do great things. It's asking us to trust a great God. <clears throat> and so, a little bit of this will move mountains. As I said, we're so glad you're here. We're hoping that through a little bit of faith in God, the Lord will meet with us in this meeting. Uh, I was at the Houston meeting earlier this year. And the Lord's presence there was so real and so deep. It was intense. But it wasn't just a thrill or he wasn't just pouring out a blessing. But there was the presence of God in that meeting drawing a people into a closer walk with him. We have to lose some of our own carnality in order to have room for more spirituality we have to lose some of our worldliness in order to have room for more godliness. Uh, there were many who in that Houston meeting heard music and singing that wasn't coming from earthly voices, wasn't coming from earthly musical instruments. Maybe it was a sound from heaven. But I'd love it if the Lord himself or the angelic hosts would blend into worship with us over these next several days. Wouldn't it be awesome if they joined us in worship? There's a scripture in the third chapter of uh, Zephaniah that I've been using a lot lately. Zephaniah is near the end of the Old Testament, right after Habakkuk, right before Haggai. Um, and the third chapter of the book of Zephaniah, um, in verse, let me see, verse 14, it says, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout. O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. There's something for us to do. We're to sing and we're to shout. We're to rejoice in the Lord. But then down in verse 17, it says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee. And uh, if the Lord will come in our midst, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee, he is mighty. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee. He's the one who's mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Wouldn't it be awesome if somehow what we are doing this weekend here in Des Moines, Iowa, those of us who've gathered here, would bring such a, a joy to the Lord that he would begin to rejoice over his people with singing. 
Uh, I would like to experience that, not just for the thrill, but I would like to feel that drawing of the Holy Spirit of God, drawing us to a closer walk with Him. I'd love to hear the Lord singing in, in the midst of His people. In many scriptures, it's biblical, there were sounds. On a day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, there was a sound from heaven like of a rushing mighty wind. Uh, there was a time when David in 2 Samuel was fighting the Philistines and he asked the Lord, shall I go up against them? And the Lord said, no, you circle around behind them and you wait, but you'll hear the sound of a rustling in the mulberries. And when you hear that sound, I don't think that was just the east wind blowing. I think that was God from heaven making a sound that they were attuned to. They were listening for a sound because when that sound came, there was victory in the camp. There was another time later in, in uh, 2 Kings, the seventh chapter, when the... Uh, the, uh, the, our adversaries of the Lord had, had uh, besieged the city and the enemies heard a sound of marching and chariots and they said, oh no, these Jews have hired the Egyptians and the Syrians beyond the river, the Hittites beyond the river. We better hightail it out of here uh, because there was a sound that they heard that wasn't originating from earth. And it caused the enemies to flee. There was another time, I just love these instances, there was a time when Elisha and his servant were surrounded in the city. And it looked like it was all over. And Elisha said, Lord, open this young man's eyes. And when his eyes were open, he saw the chariots of fire, the chariots of God all around that city. Uh, wouldn't it be awesome if the angels of God would sing in a way that we heard it here on earth. If we could see the chariots of God, uh, again, not just for the thrill, not just for a memorable experience, but something that we can receive in our hearts as a call from heaven to surrender more to the Lord and to draw into a closer relationship with him. And hopefully, we can hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Uh, we can see what God is, is wanting us as a body to do in every meeting in the body of Christ. I believe there can be heavenly direction. Uh, and I'd like to uh, ask the Lord to help us to recognize what we need as a body in order to move into the future. The healing in the body of Christ has been awesome. It has been amazing. I just, just am overwhelmed at what the Lord has done uh, in the last, what, 15 years? I don't know, something like that. It's just awesome. It's amazing. But there were men who came to David, and some came to him in Ziklag, and some came to him in Hebron uh, with a heart to help. Some were or men of war, they could keep rank, uh, they could use a sword in either hand. But the smallest number that came, and I'm referring back to First Chronicles, the 12th chapter, were the men of Issachar. In First Chronicles 12 and verse 32, there was 200. But there was something very special about these 200. It wasn't so much their ability to handle a, short, a sword and a shield, but it said the men of Issachar had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And because of that, David put them in leadership positions because it's incumbent upon leaders to have an understanding of the times to know what the work of God ought to be doing. And I'm not claiming any position. I'm not claiming any right or authority to give direction to the body of Christ. Please understand me. Jesus is the head of the body, and, and we have a platform here full of servants and a congregation of servants of the Lord. But we're all seeking 
to understand what is our master's will. One thing I've had to learn is that the servant doesn't tell the master how he's going to serve him. I've had to learn that. Too many times in my life I figured out how I was going to serve God. I had it all worked out. You know, I was practicing law. I had a six-figure income. I was going to do this. I was going to do that. And I was going to serve God this way. And the master doesn't let the servant tell him how he's going to serve. The master tells the servant what to do. And a good servant will hear his master's voice. And so I think the, we need men of Issachar in the body of Christ who have an understanding of the times and who ought to know what, what Israel ought to do who know what this body ought to be doing. And as I was praying, I have came up with uh, seven very simple thoughts that I'd just like to present for your consideration. I believe with all of my heart that this is the body of Christ. And I think these are some objectives that, that we could and should accomplish to continue to be the authentic representation of Jesus to this world. There's a lot of details with each of them, but I'm not going to take very much time, at least I hope not, to go through these principles. Some of them sound contradictory or even somewhat of a paradox, but if we balance them properly, I think they'll point us in the right direction. Seven is, of course, God's number, and I think these seven principles will help us as we move forward. If we're going to be who we think we should be and who we believe God's called us to be, then we need godly biblical principles to guide us. Number one, this movement must become stable without becoming rigid. This movement must become stable without becoming rigid. The simple, undeniable fact is that this body became unstable after the death of Brother William Souders, splits and divisions have been our legacy for over 60 years. We have preached the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, but we've divided over doctrine. We've divided over leadership, over direction, over other matters. But we've lived to see the healing of the body, and that's a miracle. A healed beast necessitates a healed body. But we have to decide that we are fully committed to this healed body. We can't stand by on the outer periphery, keeping our options open, ready to walk away if we don't like what's happening. If we think, well, let me say it, if this is that, that we think is it, then we need to get all the way in it. If this is that, that we think is it, then we need to get all the way in it. And our ministry has to be like the 12 oxen that bore that brazen laver. That they had their hinder parts inward and could stand shoulder to shoulder and carry the work of God. We need to pledge not to separate, not to spoil one another's houses, not to sow discord among brethren. We have to be stable, but we can't become rigid. Babylon is rigid. Babylonish organizations are very rigid. And if we build a man-made cart for the Ark of the Covenant, we'll lose our standing as the authentic body of Christ. It's going to take a balancing to consider how can we become stable without imposing some kind of rigid order that is foreign to the body of Christ I don't have the details I'm just throwing seven things out there there's a lot more I could say about this but I want to to go on but we as a people have to be stable without becoming rigid number two this body must be dynamic without losing our static properties. 
must be dynamic without losing our static properties. Because the church has not yet been restored, that means we are going to have to change. I, I hate to admit it, but I have to admit that I, our, my doctrine is probably not the pure, unadulterated truth that the early church has. Our order is not there yet. All of us are going to have to change something in order to get restored. If the church isn't restored yet, that means there's something more that needs to change. We have to be dynamic enough to change, uh, to get back to perfect New Testament order and message. Change is necessary, but you know, nobody likes to change. There's people who won't change because they get comfortable where they are. They may need to change. They might even need to change their diet. But they get comfortable where they are. They need to change. But it's hard to change. Change can be a good thing as long as it's progressive and not regressive. But there's static properties that we can't lose either. The consistency of our vision, that can't change. Uh, the, the, our purpose, what God's called us to be, we can't lose that. I've seen people lose that. They forgot what God called us to be. And they thought God called us to be something else or like something else. And they're no longer here. They lost some of the static properties See, it's uh, uh, Proverbs twenty two twenty eight says, Remove not the ancient landmarks which your fathers have set. There's some landmarks that can't be changed. And the art of godly leadership is to know when to change, what to change, and what to hold on to. If we change too much, We'll lose our identity as the body of Christ. If we refuse to change, we'll drive our tent pegs too deep. And the cloud and the fire will move on and we're stuck here. It's a delicate balancing act. And I can say more about this. I'm just offering these points for consideration. Such a great host of witnesses here on this platform. I'd like to make as much time as possible. But number three... This body must be unmovable and yet able to move on with God. Must be unmovable and yet able to move with God. Sounds like a paradox, doesn't it? And it sounds similar to what I was saying about being stable without being rigid, but I have a kind of different focus in mind. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, the end of the chapter, he said, Be ye steadfast unmovable, always abounding uh, in the faith. And there are winds of ideology that threaten to, to sweep us off course. There are waves of worldliness that beat against the ship of Zion. And if we aren't careful, the winds and the waves will lead us to shipwreck on the same rocks that have shipwrecked every other movement since the Protestant Reformation. There were winds that drove those movements and off course. There were waves that battered those movements. I think there were men called of God through the Reformation, but they didn't finish what God called them to start. And their movements all shipwrecked. I sure don't want to see this movement that I've dedicated my heart and my life to. I don't want to see this movement shipwreck on the rocks. I don't want the winds to blow us off course. There's an appointed harbor. There's a destination that the Lord has for the old ship of Zion. And it's just over the horizon. We've been getting closer to it. But we've got to get to that harbor. There's rocks and there's winds of ideology. People say this about you. You're intolerant. You won't accept the times, this and that. And some of those waves can cause a ship to go off course into dangerous waters. Oh. 
God's a progressive God. If we move with the world or with the religious world, we'll lose God. But if we fail to follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth, he'll go off and leave us. <coughs> See, we can leave God by getting off course. But if we fail to go with him, he'll go on off and leave us. See, Martin Luther said the word of God can leave us. And it did. They still have the just shall live by faith, but they are not, pardon me, they're just not the present truth. And my pastor, Brother James Souders, used to say, don't you think you can fence God into a corner? He'll jump that fence every time. We can't say because we were, we always will be. Because we were doesn't mean we always will be. Can we differentiate between worldly currents and heavenly direction? See, that's incumbent upon us. We've got to differentiate between worldly currents and heavenly direction. Moving closer to our goal and not moving further from our God. Unmovable people who are constantly moving on with the Lamb. Number four. This movement must be broken in spirit without wounded spirits. There's a difference between a broken spirit and a wounded spirit. Um, so many scriptures. Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken uh, heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Um, I think when David was repenting in the 51st Psalm, he said the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. And then, uh, um, oh, Isaiah 66 and verse 2 says, I think it says, to this man will I look, to them, him that's of a humble and a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Um, there's a, the right kind of a spirit that we must have. Jesus wanted us to fall on the rock and break so that the rock doesn't fall on us and grind us to powder. Um, the proud, unbroken spirit of man is not what the Lord's looking for from us. He's looking for a meek, humble group of disciples who are clothed with humility he said, come unto me, Matthew eleven twenty eight. come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls if you take my yoke upon you. He was meek and lowly of heart. We can be the most effective for God when we're completely broken. And yet, we can't be what we should be if we have wounded spirits or if we wound the spirits of others. See, if our spirits are wounded, we can't hear God. It's the spirit in man that God gives understanding to. God communes with our soul through our spirit. And that spirit has to be functioning and open and receptive to the moving of the Holy Ghost. In Proverbs 18 and verse 14, I think it is, Proverbs 18 and verse 14, um, it says the spirit of man will, will bear him in his infirmity. Let me see if I can find it. I found Proverbs, but I can't find the 18th chapter. There it is. It's right before chapter 19. Wouldn't you believe it? But in verse 14, it says, The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? Um, a wounded spirit leads to a broken heart. But Jesus said when he started his ministry and was reading from Isaiah 61, 
He said, I've come to bind up the broken hearts. <clears throat> Wounds to our spirits come from negative words, from painful events. They come from some violation of our person or our right. Something crushes our human spirit and leaves the person in emotional pain. We have to have a broken and a contrite spirit, but we can't have a wounded spirit or a broken heart. And we can't inflict those wounds on others. Not if we're going to be what we want the Lord to make this body. We've got to have the kind of a spirit that God will bless. Number five. This body must have godly leadership without lords over God's heritage. It seems that the Lord's drawing closer to us as he asks us to draw closer to him. And we really have a wonderful heritage. I believe that we are the spiritual descendants of the church that came out of the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And David said in one of the Psalms, the 16th Psalm, he said, the lions have fallen to me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. And we appreciate our heritage, but we need assurance that the Lord's leading this body, still leading this body on, and that it's still connected to the head, and that he will lead us into the future. I want to take just a couple of minutes, if you will allow me, in the early chapters of the book of Joshua. Uh, right after Deuteronomy, go to the first chapter of the book of Joshua. And in the, the fifth verse of the first chapter, in the second half of that verse, the Lord told Joshua, he said, As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. And I'm looking for the Lord to assure a people that as he was with, and I'm not just looking to some of our prior leadership from a few years ago, but I believe that I'd like the Lord to assure us that as I was with the Apostle Paul, as I was with Peter, as I was with Thomas and Andrew, when a church came out of the upper room, so I'm going to be with a church in these last days. I'd like for us to connect back to that heritage and have a great uh, uh, assurance from the Lord. This was tremendous for Joshua, but there were conditions. If you read uh, the next few ver verses, 7 and verse 8, there were certain things that he had to do, uh, you know, keep the law, but he ended up in the end of verse 8 saying, thou shalt have good success. That's the only time the word success is found in the King James translation of the Bible. You can read all cover to cover and the word success only shows up one time. But if Joshua would do what the Lord asked him to do, he assured Joshua, you'll have success. And if we'll do, I feel like if we'll do what the Lord's asking us to do as a body, I feel like we're going to have success. Uh, and the important point is that Joshua needed to know that the Lord was going to be with him like he had been with the prior leadership. And I think we need heaven's assurance that he's going to be with us like he was the early church. And uh, the third chapter of Joshua, in verse 7, the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. A new generation had come on the scene in Joshua's day. The prior generation had died off because of their unbelief. Uh, it was gone. They had not seen them. These people had not seen the miracles in Egypt or barely remembered them. They had not seen the parting of the Red Sea. They'd heard about it. Uh, in Joshua chapter 5, in verse, uh, verse 6, For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness, till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed, 
because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord sware that he would not show them the land which the Lord sware unto their fathers to give us a land that flowed with milk and honey. The generation was gone, and there were men and women who had not seen God part the Red Sea. But you know, when God began to magnify Joshua, they saw God part the flooded Jordan River. And the same God who parted the Red Sea before, he could part the Jordan River in their day. Another thing happened um, that in the fifth chapter of the book of Joshua, he needed this. In verse 13, he sees a man with a sword drawn in his hand. And he walked over to him and basically said, who are you? Are you for us? Are you for our adversaries? And he said, nay. He said, but it's the captain of the Lord's host. Uh, I, I believe that was a Christophany. I believe that was a, a pre-first advent appearance of Jesus Christ. I think he's the captain of the Lord's host. Uh, that's who. And... Uh, and Joshua bowed down and worshiped him, and the angels don't let you do that. John tried that in the book of Revelation. The angel said, see that thou do it not. I believe that was a Christophany. And uh, there's many times that Christ appeared to help his ministry. The message that Paul got, he didn't learn it from man. He wasn't taught it from the other apostles. But he had a Christophany. He had an appearance of the Lord that, that gave him what he needed. And he could carry that message. And when he got to Jerusalem and compared notes, uh, they that seemed to be much in counsel, they couldn't add anything to him because he'd received it uh, by direct revelation from the Lord. And, and uh, Joshua needed a direct revelation from the Lord. And he got that. Uh, I really believe, brothers, saints, that this body needs some direct uh, intervention. I'd like to see a Christophany. Not necessarily for me, but I think we really need Christophany in order to get us to the point where we need to be. I can argue with Brother Brown about whether you move out a live soul or not, but I don't think either one of us is going to argue, argue with Jesus Christ. If we could get the truth from the man who is truth. Paul did. I know Paul was a great man, but I believe there has to be great people in these last days for this church to be what the early church was. There has to be a connection. Like God was with that early church, he's got to be with the latter church. We can argue for years about whether there's a devil or not. But somebody knows. And we dare not argue with him. And I don't believe we would. And then there was an altogether new type of miracle in the next chapter. The walls of Jericho fell flat. This showed they could overcome the odds and prevail against the impossible. And you know how it went. They went out and marched around those walls Seven or six days, and nothing happened. Just like Elijah's servant went out on Mount Carmel to look out over the sea six times, and nothing happened. But there came a time that was different. There came a day. On that seventh day, when they marched around those walls, God intervened. Yes. We've looked for a cloud like a man's hand for so many times. We've marched around the wall so many times. That doesn't mean that we can give up. Doesn't mean we can stop. Or maybe we've gone five times. We need to go a sixth time and definitely a seventh time. We need to just keep going until the Lord. Shows us that he's ready for us to go into his promised land. And there is a promised land where milk and honey flows. There is a promised land for his people. But we need some divine intervention. And we need godly leadership. And leaders lead. Shepherds lead sheep from the front. 
Cowboys drive cattle from behind. We need shepherds. We don't need any cowboys. We're not to drive God's people. We're to lead them. Be thou an example to the flock. Be thou an example. Of course, we all know Peter's admonition not to be lords over God's heritage. 1 Peter 5.13, I think it is. 5.3, maybe. Um, be thou examples to the flock. I've got to move on. I'll take forever. Um, number, am I at number six? This body must have godly success without human pride. As the Lord draws us closer and makes bare his holy arm, we're going to have to be ever vigilant against the deadly sin of pride. If we get proud of who we are, or what we do, we will lose God. And yet we must have success. The early church had great successes. And the Lord's going to vindicate some people as his own, as his own private treasure. He'll manifest himself to that people with signs and wonders and spiritual victories. But whatever the devil is, he always tempts the successful to fall into the pit of pride. I'm not going to cite a whole bunch of scriptures about pride overcoming pride, condemning pride. You know they're in there. But however you interpret the two witnesses of Revelation 13, whether it's a historical church through a wilderness for 1,260 years or whether that's still a future prophecy, either way they're clothed in sackcloth. And the representation of the Lord's body has to be clothed in sackcloth have to be clothed in humility. If you really expect God to stand with you, you can't say, look what we've done. Look who we are. God's with us. God's not with them. You know. <sighs> Success is far more dangerous than failure. Success is a very dangerous position. Deuteronomy warned several times, particularly the sixth chapter, you know, once you're full and you've come into this land and there's cities you didn't build and there's houses you didn't build and you've got all this and you've got victory, then be careful. You'll forget God. You'll forget God. Success is a very dangerous condition. You know, I've learned more from my failures than I ever have from my successes. Oftentimes, I fail to get the lesson from my successes. But you let me really mess up, and I learned some pretty good lessons. Anyway, that's... Brother Isaac, that one doesn't cost you anything. That's just thrown in. But there will be a people who are successful... Uh, Daniel 11.32 says, the, They that know their God shall do exploits. The people that know their God are going to do exploits. They'll be strong. But it's going to be a humble, righteous, holy, godly body of people. Number seven. Hey, he's almost through. Praise God. Number seven. This movement must have power with God and not just... The the power of God. I've heard Brother Gary Wright talk about this. And we hear a lot about the power of God. But the scriptures sometimes refer to having power with God. Uh, let me just give you two of them. One's back in Genesis. In Genesis, the 32nd chapter. Um, Genesis chapter 32, and, and I think it's verse 28. It's the Lord speaking to Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Another scripture is in the book of Hosea, which is right after Daniel, the 12th chapter of the book of Hosea. It's probably referring back to this 
this very incident, but it says in Hosea 12 and, and verse 3, speaking of, of uh, Jacob, he said, he took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. It was significant that the scripture said power with God. Uh, in a sense, Jacob had influence because God clothed him with authority. The Lord's done that a lot of times to men and women. He gave them authority. The Lord never gives power just for the benefit of the person who receives it, but it's for the benefit of his work. And the end of Gentile times is going to see a body of people that have power with God, that have the authority of God, not just to do a few miracles or to heal a few people, you may see that happen in Babylon. doesn't mean they have power with God. They may have experienced the power of God. Uh, but that doesn't mean they have power with God. Uh, there have been times that even well, all kinds of people who've had experiences with God. Even Saul, when he was trying to kill David, began to prophesy. That doesn't mean he had power with God. It just meant he was experiencing the power of God. And it, and God expects us to be good stewards of, of the resources he's given us, but he also expects us to be good stewards of the authority he places in our hands. We're not looking for the trappings of power, but we're earnestly seeking the power of God and power with God. We need power with God in our lives and in our churches if we're going to be who we believe this body's going to be. Um, authority. Authority over devils. Authority over diseases. Authority over the work of God. Authority to bind heaven because you bound something on earth. You think every religious group out there has that? No. But there's going to be a body that does. Not just the power of God, you can see that in three score queens and four score concubines, you can see that in the virgins without number, but actual power with God. And sure, power can be misused, so can money, so can musical talent, so can every good gift from God. But the fact that some people have misused God's authority or misused God's talent or misused God's money doesn't mean that we should be prevented from what God can give us if we'll use it right. If we keep a broken spirit and shun human pride, I believe we can draw so close to the Lord that he clothes this body with his authority. So I'm through. Let me conclude. If this wonderful body, can you put those seven things back up? If this wonderful body can become stable without becoming rigid. Well, I can't even read that. I've only had seven eye surgeries. have another one coming up next week. It'll only be eight, but anyway. Um, but if we can become dynamic without losing our static properties. If we can be unmovable people who are moving on with God. If we can be broken in our spirit without being wounded or wounding others in their spirit. If we can recognize godly leaders who refuse to become lords over God's heritage. If we can handle godly success without human pride and gain power with God and not just the power of God. And if we can have just, just a little bit of faith in God. I believe we'll march forward to the destiny that the Bible depicts for the true church of our Lord Jesus Christ at the close of Gentile times. Again, thank you for being here. Praise God. Brethren, this pulpit is as open as we can make it. With a lot of good gifts of God here. I hope we are able to hear from many that we can mingle our wine and get a lot of benefit from a lot of different sources. Most of all, I pray 
that the Spirit of God is here so rich that maybe the band can quit playing at times, and that doesn't, that's not a signal to stop worshiping. But because the power of God is here and His presence is here, that when the earthly music stops, we just keep on reaching out more and more, asking God to come in greater and greater. And who knows, maybe the Lord our God in the midst of thee will rejoice over thee with joy and rest in his love and joy over thee with singing. Wouldn't that be awesome? So God bless you all. Can we have a chorus here or something? Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. Amen. Amen.